So of course we talked about the term ankh meaning life and so forth, and ankhwa and akan meaning life. But of course we also showed that the term ankh meaning life with the determinative of the shrouded male figure, ancestral spirit and so forth. But then another term for ankh, spelling for ankh, which is the critical spelling that we brought forward is the symbol for the ankh, but then the animal, the domesticated animal with the ankh around its neck in the form of a yoke. And of course that links ankh and yonk and yoke etymologically, sound wise, but also cosmologically to what the ankh is, it's literally a yoke. And then of course the sahu, which is the spirit body. And one of the spellings of sahu, sa or sahu is the S-A-H. Once again, you see not only the shrouded figure, the spirit, but the animal with the ankh around its neck in the form of a yoke. So that ties the ankh yoke to the spirit body. And the key is to yoke your spirit body to your kai, your kai, the soul, the divine consciousness, the divinity in the head region. You want to align your thoughts, intentions, and actions, your functions, you know, as you're operating in the world, you want to align your spirit with your soul. You want to align your sum sum or your sahu with the ka, the ka, the divine con consciousness, the divinity in the head region. So we talked about that and we talked about ankh and yoke is the same thing. Now, We also talked about the fact that the, in the Akan language, the term Onkwa means life, of course. And you also have the Akua Do, Akua Ba, also called Akua and so forth, plural Onkwa, um, which is the symbol of life. And we talked about how, you know, the story in, in Akan culture is Akua Ba. Ba means child or offspring, Akua is a female born on Wednesday, named after the divinity, Akua, who we're gonna talk about in a second. They talk about a woman named Akua who was infertile, she couldn't get pregnant. She went to the Okonfo, the priest, you know, the spiritualist and so forth. He carved a wooden doll for her, um, ritually prepared it, the ritual invocation and so forth, told her to carry the doll around on her back, just like a baby and so forth. Hold on one second. Okay. And, you know, after a while, she became pregnant. She went from being infertile to fertile and so forth. That ankh talisman draws in the spirit, the divinity. Akua. And that draws in the divinity, Akua, and stimulates that energy circulating through the loop going through the shaft and circulating through the loop generates an electromagnetic field that brings the energy of Akua because one of the terms for Kua, the divinity Akua, who is Nebit Het in um means fertility. So she stimulates that fertility and then the womb is fertile and so forth. So we talked about that and of course associated with the reality that Nebit Het is the wife of Set. Um, and at first Nebit Het was quote unquote infertile, but then eventually she gave birth to Anpu. And Anpu is the one who mummifies and so forth as we talked about earlier. So we talked about that reality that the Ankh, Ankhwa, is the same symbol that we've been using for thousands of years. Now the whites and their offspring are unaware of what the nature of the Ankh is. And they have all kinds of speculations about it and what it could possibly be. And some of our people have picked up on that as well. In fact, let me pull back. And you see the different divinities holding the Ankh and so forth. We showed that Anpu in a funerary context is utilizing the Ankh when the energy moves through the shaft and circulates through the, you know, loop and generates an electromagnetic field. Whatever divinity is holding the Ankh, their particular energy is being wielded or transmitted through that talisman and so forth. So if Anpu is holding the Ankh, then that Anpu energy is radiating from the talisman. If Pata is holding the Ankh, then Pata's energy is radiating through the talisman and so forth. So 
in a funerary context, the person's spirit is being aligned or realigned or recalibrated by the divinity. And we already talked about the fertility context. So there's a fertility function for the young, um, you know, and a funerary function for the young. And then we talked about the fact that there is a, let me see if we have it up here. No, we have it in the other article. So let's go to the other article real quick. It is the Akua article. And that's in the chat room as well. The Akradin Bosom underscore Akua article. That's the one we're looking at. So that's page nine. But just so you can see, Akua. We this whole article is talking about the divinity Akua. People born on Wednesday, Akua da are named after her Akua. Their Kradin is Akua, that is Nebit Het, the wife of Set and so forth. We talk about her vessel on the head and how it's the same name you find in Akan language, you find it in ancient Kanid and Kemet. Um, and what the vessel means and all of that. So and then, of course, she governs the clouds full of rainwater. She governs the rainwater and the renal system. So we go into detail about that, but we talked about the fertility function. Um, the fertility function, Akua Vidal, fertility function, as we talked about, but then there's a, um, and the Akan term, Kua, also carries the meaning plantation, farm, fertile land. Okua Fo is a farmer and so forth. So that's the fertility aspect which we, everybody knows about that. But then the key piece is there's also a funerary aspect. And as you can see, these are funerary sculptures. We talked about that before, um, that are placed at the, you know, graves and so forth of the deceased in Akan tradition. Still has the similar neck with the rings and so forth around the neck, the same eyes and face and so forth. But sometimes they have the body and sometimes they do not. As you can see here, sometimes it's just the head, face, and the neck. Sometimes it's the, you know, face, you know, lifted up, looking up from the grave and so forth, but then part of the body as well. Okay. But, and what we were able to show is, of course, that is the same symbol of Nevit Het on her head and so forth. So we have the funerary function of the Ankh, but the, the fertility function of the Ankh, which we already know about, utilizing the Ankh to fertilize and so forth, stimulate fertility, but then the funerary function also ma matches the crown of Nebit Het that distinguishes her from other, you know, divinities. So we show that relationship. And we also show that very often the fusion of the Jed and the Ankh if you turn the Akua doll around, you'll see there's a jet pillar on the back of the head and so forth. We continue to use that same um, symbolism, but the key part here is this. Ankit. Ankit or Ankut and so forth, which is Akua. The Ankh is the symbol or the shrine for Nebit Het, first and foremost. And of course, other divinities will work along with the Nebit Het. You'll see Aset and Nebuchadnezzar working together. You'll see Wachet and Bast working together. You'll see Aset and Bast working together. You'll see Raet and Aset working together, just like you have your lungs and heart complex, the heart and lung complex that are working together. You have the different organs and endocrine glands and so forth all working together. Different organs work together in systems. Different deities work together in systems. That doesn't mean they're the same deity, but they work together. So when you see um, the Ankh, that is the talisman first and foremost on the female side of Nebit Het. But then when people are utilizing the talisman and so forth, wielding that talisman, you know, they're, they're working along with Nebit Het to wield that energy. So most people are unaware of the anthropomorphized versions of the Ankh with the two arms and hands that continue to knock on tradition. So when people are talking about the Ankh might represent the vertebrae of a bull, 
or a sandal strap, or they don't know, or simply a mirror case, they don't know what it is. Then many people talk about the ankh represents the, you know, the loop is the female, you know, the womb and so forth, and the straight portion is the male, and there's a fusion of the male and female. That's totally inaccurate. It's never been true. People are making things up, you know, and some people listen to what the whites and their offspring was saying and pseudo occultism. Some people just going along with things that sounded good, especially back in the 80s and 90s and so forth. People would just say anything that sounded deep or spiritual or, you know, um, that hadn't been heard before or metaphysical, and our people just would run with that. But that's never been accurate, as we can see here. The Ankh has always been a divinity, and that divinity is never had. That divinity is Akua, and the Akua Ba, the child of Akua, her child and so forth, delineates who the mother is. So, Ankit, the living one, has always been Nebit Het. Now, you want to get a little bit further. So you have the term Anku, the living, the beatified in heaven, the living ones and so forth, the ancestresses and ancestors who are spiritually cultivated. That's plural Anku. Then you have Anki, which is singular. Anki, the singular one, the ones who live in harmony with order, just like the Aku, the spirits, the glorified spirits of the dead, the sainted dead, meaning the illuminated ones, beings of light, wise, instructed folk. We, folk, we talked about how when your aura is bright and vibrant because you're living in harmony with order, if someone sees you clairvoyantly, your spirit clairvoyantly, you have a, you know, vibrant, powerful aura. If you're out of harmony with order, your aura is smaller and dimmer and so forth. It's not as vibrant and powerful and it's more porous, meaning you can get penetrated by other negative energy projections and so forth, by individuals and entities and so forth. So um, so the Aku is one designation or description of the illuminated or spiritually cultivated ancestresses and ancestors, the shining ones and so forth associated with stars, but not because they come from the stars. It has nothing to do with that kind of nonsense. Just like stars are illuminate and they light your way in the darkness, a radiant, illuminate, powerful, grounded, wise, ancestral spirit has a, a luminous aura. So when they show up at the shrine or show up when you're pouring libation or engage in ritual prayer, possession, spirit possession and so forth, you see that illuminant aura around that spirit and they light up the quote unquote darkness in the ritual space exactly where you are, akin to stars in the sky lighting up the darkness at night. So that's where the, there's an association with stars and people and so forth, the spirits. So that's one uh, description of them, but then Anku, as their nature and character, the living ones and so forth, is another description. Plural Anku, singular Anki, and Anki, of course, is Yonki or Yonki or Yogi. So this is where you get a Yogi or Yogini and so forth, a male or female in, engaged in quote unquote Yogo or Yonk or Ankh. This is where it comes from in reality. Now, we talked about some more with regard to that. Okay, so let's switch from that to get to our document. Oh, this is the wrong one. Now, first and foremost, before we even get to, let's go a little bit further. We said on key. is the female divinity on Kita, on Ket, on Kut, and so forth, different pronunciations. But you also have <clears throat> Ankh, the sun, it says of Sothis, but it's actually Sapatit. So the star Sapatit is so-called Sirius of Sothis. There's a male deity named Ankh, and he's the son of Sapatit, or the son of quote unquote Sothis. Hold on one second, let me move this over. Okay, so you have a male deity, you have a male Ankh and a female Ankh, male and female, you know, divinities. That's Anku, Awuku, and Akua, and so forth. Now, we 
we're accustomed to seeing, you know, the regular onks that we were showing, that we're typically, you know, typically seeing and so forth, and the regular Akua Badals that we're accustomed to seeing. We're accustomed to seeing the Akua Badal, you know, with the two arms and so forth, but we're not accustomed to seeing, for example, in the Fonte tradition, sometimes they will have the ovular head like normal, sometimes the Fonte people, as well as some of the Bono people, the Bono Akan people, who are a little bit further north, the Afanti a little bit further south in Ghana, for example. Instead of having an ovular head, sometimes they'll have a more rectangular head, sometimes a straight ring rectangle, rectangle, sometimes a rectangle with a curved top and a straight, straight sides. In this context, they have the rectangular you know, head and so forth. You see the breast of the woman, um, and it's more of a rectangular shape. That's an aesthetic that's associated with the Fonte, as well as the Bono to a certain extent. But these are still, you know, Akua. Unkua, plural. But the key is, so you can see her there, but this is the male Akua. But it's not Akua, it's Aku. And then Akua is the female. So you have the male Aku, the child of Nana Akua, and then you have the female Akua, which is, is also Akua Ba. Both of them are Akua Ba, meaning offspring Ba of the female divinity Akua, but you have a male divinity and a female divinity. You have Ankh and Ankit. In our Khan tradition, we've always had both. So we know exactly what the Ankh is because we use it every single day. We use it for fertility purposes and also for funerary purposes. And we use it every day and we still use the term Ankh or Ankhwa, meaning life. It's never stopped. So when the Whites and Arms Spring are trying to figure out what the term Ankh means, and they see the Ankh used in murals for, you know, fertilizing the woman for pregnancy and also recalibrating the spirit of the deceased and so forth, all they have to do is look at the people who continue to use the Ankhs unbroken for thousands of years and still use the same name for the same talisman, and they would know where it comes from. So, but we want to get a little bit further into it. So when you cosmologically, what is the Ankh? It is the human being, as we can see. It's not the shaft of the male and the womb, you know, the womb of the female. That's not what it is. It's it's the human being. Now, we went further to show some anthropomorphized onks. You can see here the two hands of the onk holding the, you know, scepter and so forth. You have another one with two hands and two arms holding a staff. Here you have an onk with two arms and so forth and two legs and wearing, you know, the skirt and so forth. And you have the Jed Pillar that's anthropomorphized as well. Now the Jed Pillar is simply the backbone. Sometimes people will say, well, the Ankh is the female energy and the Jed is the male energy. That's not accurate either. The Ankh is the human being. It's the female human being and the male human being. And of course the Jed Pillar, everybody has a backbone. And those vertical, you know, cervical vertebrae at the top, you know, C1 through C8 and so forth, that is where the jet pillars, the crossbars of the jet pillar are. So that's not the union, that's not the balance of the male and the female either. That's never been accurate either. Here you have the jet pillar, but then you have the tet symbol. Now, if you look at the tet symbol, they'll call it the buckle of Osset and so forth, and it's associated with the Senef in Osset. And there's a text in ancient Kemet in the Runu Pert Imheru, the so-called Book of the Dead, Book of Coming Forth by Day and so forth, that's dealing with the Tet of, or the Senef in Osset, or the blood of Osset, is talking about the ovulatory blood of Osset. Osset governs the womb and birth canal and so forth. And that Tet symbol, this is the Tet symbol. It looks like an ankh, but it's not an ankh. This is the symbol. These are the two lips of the vulva. This is the, you know, leading up into the birth canal and so forth. So you have the outer and inner lips of the vulva and so forth. Then you have the cervix and then you have 
the womb structure and it's dealing with the seneph and offset, the ovulatory blood and sometimes that ovulatory blood when the, you know, egg is released and so forth. If it's not fertilized and it be transforms into that menstrual blood and so forth and released through the womb, the shedding of the endometrium, which is the lining within the uterus, that's, you know, the menstrual blood and so forth and it's released and it's taken care of in a ritual capacity and so forth. But that is what we're talking about here, the buckle or, you know, the buckle of all sect dealing with the seneph and all set, the blood of all set that buckles is associated with the cervix that, you know, keeps the, if, if the woman is pregnant, you know, it holds the, you know, the closing the womb so the child, of course, is protected and so forth from further infection and all of that, and also held steady within the womb until it's time for the child to be born and the cervix dilates and there's expansion and the child can be born and the mucus plug is released and all of that. But, but that buckle, quote unquote, is associated with the cervix, but the inner and outer labia, or the inner and outer lips of the vulva and so forth, cervix and womb. So that is the association of that loop structure with the quote unquote bent down arms and all of that with the female anatomy. And it's directly spoken of in the text. That is not the onk. So all of this information about the onk is the female and, and or the loop is the female, never been true. But as, but as we can see proven in the Akan tradition, the same term with the same name, with the same function, and we have male and female. We have Aku and Akua. In ancient Kanadi Kemet, we have Ankh and Anki, the male divinity Ankh, and you can find him in the pyramid text being called the son of Sapate, as it's showed in the dictionary. If you go to the same pyramid text, that's referenced in the dictionary, you will find him being referred to as the son of Sapat. So you have Ankh or Anku and Akua, an Anku to Anki in ancient Kemet. You have Aku and Akua, which is the male and female, you know, quote unquote, Anks and Akan. So they represent the human being. Now, why do they represent the human being? What is the term for human being in Akan? So first the term Oni, it can mean relative relation, kinsman or kinswoman, but it means a person in general. general. So you'll see Oni um, references an individual. So if you say Akan, that's the ethnic group. If you say Meye Akan Ni, that means I am Akan. If you say Akan Fo, that means the group of people, Fo, who are Akan. If you say Akan Ni, that means the individual, Ni, who is Akan. Or if you say Obi Bri Ni, that means the individual, Ni, his, who is Obi Bri, Black, that means a Black person, Black individual, Obi Bri Ni, or Obi Bi Ni. If you say Abi Bri Fo, that's the group of people, Fo, who are Bri, Black or dark, that's Black people or Black folks, Ebi Bi Fo. But Obi Bi Ni, is the individual ni who is black, meaning a black person. And it be be mine, means the nation, mine, that is black. Abibi mine, which is Afroaka, Afroaka to Africa. That's in the Akan language and so forth. So, oni means an individual. With regard to a human being, the term pa means good, like goodness, good, and so forth. So, oni pa is the general term for a human being. The individual that quote unquote pa or good, that means the individual or entity, the living entity that's good, meaning good in context, the word good and order is the same term in our ancestral language. Everything that Inyame wa Inyame created is pa or good. Inyame wa Inyame, the great mother, great father, Amenet, Amen did not create disorder or evil. Disorder manifests when we go away from the order um established in creation and we create disorder so and Inyamewa Inyame did not direct us to engage in disorder and so forth we can fall away from order we can get back on track but so Unipa is the general term for a human being so it says man a man human being person and so forth so Unipa is human being Unipa is human beings plural go a little bit further you'll see that Ani or any 
means the I or eyes, and an, which is also ani in um, Kemet, means to turn a glance towards something. The determinative symbol is an I, but then I'm going to go real quick to another link. There's an article that we published on the origin of the name or the etymology of the name Nyame. Just to pull that up real quick. So it's a couple of terms. I mean, I and Kemet and Kemet. The term I is A R I, Ari, Ari, as in Ari, Amen, which is the title of Amen and so forth. But you see, An in ancient Kemet with the symbol for the I means to turn a glance towards something. You have A-R-T, which is arit, arit, meaning the eye. It also means a seeing, a looking, look, glance, the fact, the faculty or act of seeing. So ari, meaning a look or a glance, as well as eye, and the symbol for the eye. And then, of course, you have an, which is also ani, to turn a glance towards something, and the symbol is the eye. And, of course, that is the same. We have the same term as we can see here in our con, ani, the eye or eyes. You have ani, the eye or eyes. It also means a look. So you see that. Um, so if you say, um, if you're on a field trip and you're trying to count everybody who's, you know, got back on the bus, if it should be, you know, 20 people on the bus, and you may say, we're gonna get a head count to see how many people are here. You count all the heads and so forth. So sometimes the word for head is used for the term for human being. But then if you say, if you're um, having a, you know, a presentation, and you're trying to get people's attention and you say, you could say, everybody focus on me, everybody focus on me. Or you can say, all eyes on me, that means, everybody look at me you're still identifying the individual with through saying their eyes you're into identifying the person with their eyes all eyes on me meaning you look at me all eyes and me or all of you on me people on me meaning person and me meaning eyes look at me so we're associating the individual with the eye. So you see the same term in ancient Kanidi Kemet that you have in Akan referencing the individual representing the person. So we just wanted to make that connection. So if Onipa is the human being and the root is Oni meaning the individual, then you have what is the term for the human body? The figure, form, shape, of the body, the body is onipadria. And it can also mean the character, stamp, kind or sort of a person, but the person is onipa, that's a human being. But the body of the human being is the onipa, the person's dria. What, is the, what, what does dria mean? Does it just mean body or figure, form, or shape of the body or shape of the person? Dria comes from edria, edua or edria, meaning plant, tree, shrub. And indria means plants, trees, shrubs, and so forth. So the human body is associated with a tree. We standing on earth, have our feet firmly planted, and we go up and our head is up, up in the sky and so forth, and the, the branches of the trees, our arms and so forth, the boughs, the branches, and our woolly hair and so forth is the foliage of the tree. So we're considered the physical body of the person in the Akan culture is considered a tree. Onipa dria, the person's dria, the person's tree is their physical body. And of course, as you can see, 
as we said, the ankh is the individual. We have the male ankh, we have the female ankh. We have the male akua, we have the female akua. Feet firmly planted in the ground, water and minerals in the soil absorbed by the roots. Transpiration, the loss of water from leaves, mostly through strom stomata, creates a force within leaves that pulls the xylem sap upward and so forth. So when you look at this process, you know, the release of, you know, um, oxygen and so forth, and then we breathe in oxygen, and then we release carbon dioxide and everything else, what you're looking at, something dealing with the underworld, the roots in the underworld, on the surface of earth, and then in the quote unquote sky or heaven. There's a three pronged structure of creation in our Khan tradition as manifest through the Ahinasa or the triangle. And that three pronged structure is the same as they say in ancient Kani to Kemet. They'll say heaven, earth, and the Duat, or they'll say um, Pet, Ta, and, you know, Duat. And we'll say, you know, Asase is the earth. Equim is the sky, and Asamando is the ancestral realm. So heaven, earth, and the duat, and so forth, the heavenly realm, earthly realm, and the underworld, and spirit realm, and so forth. You have the tree operating in the underworld on the surface, and then in the heavens receiving the energy from the sun, and so forth, um, and, and the stars as well, and the planets and everything, and drawing that in from, from the heavenly realm, drawing it in, and also drawing from the earth you know, the energy upward to stimulate us and we're operating on all three levels. So that Onipa Driya, that's the human being. Now, if we look at, of course, you look at the natural hair of the Akurakani Akuraikadid individual. Of course, that structure is the same. One of the reasons we have the rounded structure of the head and so forth because we are represented as Onipadriya, the human being, Onipa's body is an Udriya or Idriya, it's a tree. That has nothing to do with the union of the female womb and the male, you know, um, shaft and so forth coming together in the ankh that has nothing to do with it. Now, that has to do ritually, um, cosmologically, with this notion 